Hello, everyone. Thank you guys for tuning in and signing up. It's always a pleasure to bring these Sounds Academy Summer Series workshops to you guys today. So this one I'm really excited about because you guys get to, so on Monday what we did was we talked about artistic entrepreneurs, so people that did music, and now they've used other skills to learn how to do business with the music that they do. And now we're gonna be talking to individuals that still play music or did music in high school or college, and now they do something completely different. So you guys get to ask them questions. So remember our Q and A's where you guys can ask questions, and we're going to get started right away here. So the first person I'm going to introduce is Devron. So Devron is an experienced executive producer with a demonstrated history of working in the computer games industry. Devron is the VP of development at Harmonix. He discovered two of his passions, music and video games through his work at Harmonix. From the moment he started, he was hooked on the concept of bringing the experience of playing music to people through video games. He was the producer of the game Rock Band and worked his way up through production from associate producer to executive producer over the years. Can I please get two claps for Devron? And can you say hello to everyone, Devron? Hello, everyone. <laughs> All right, next I'm gonna introduce Miss Nina Mullins. And so some of you may have recognized her from our dinner that we had about two years ago. So Nina is a senior leader at SRP, the third largest public nonprofit power utility, utility in the country. Nina was the recipient of the 2018 Most Influential Women Award. She became the first female relay tech in SRP history and even graduated as Apprentice of the Year. Can I please get two claps for Miss Nina Mullins? Can you say hello, Nina? Hello, everybody. Good to see you. And last but not least, we have Mr. Ilya Risky, who is the Deputy Director of Arts and Culture and Mesa Art Center. Ilya was born in Detroit, but he calls Phoenix his home. He is the guitarist in the group Phoenix, Phoenix Afrobeat Orchestra, a 16-strong orchestra is comprised of the most ambitious and outrageous musicians in Phoenix today. Ilya has had a distinct style of playing guitar, one that always stands out in a crowd. He is a part of the Flynn Brown cohort where its mission is to improve the quality of life in Arizona to benefit future generations. Can I get two claps for Ilya? And can you say hello, Ilya? Hi everybody, happy to be here. All right, excellent. All right, so remember guys, I'm gonna start with some questions, but you guys can put the questions in the Q&A of this. Uh, so first, I want you guys to just dive a little bit deeper into um, what it is that you do and where you work, um, just so our students get a better concept of you know, what it is that you guys do. So anyone could go first for this one. Well, I'll jump in because mine's probably like the least uh, sexiest of all the <laughs> the employments, but I work for the second largest utility company in um, Arizona, that was just APS and SRP. Um, I've actually been here, um, this year is my 35th anniversary. Um, yes, I, I'm, I'm the old one in the group, um, but it's been a great career. And it, I started out actually um, 35 years ago as a meter reader, just wanting to get my foot in the door. Um, and then um, through education, I got my master's, I have my bachelor's degree before I came here. Um, through SRP, I um, was able to acquire my master's degree and always wanted to get into leadership in some capacity. So after I had finished my master's degree six months later, um, landed my first managerial position. And this just always had aspirations to grow from there. Um, a year and a half after I had my first manager's position, I was able to get my first director's position. I was actually the sole um, female director in a company of 5,000 employees. Wow. Um, so I um, worked my way. That was a little bit, um, when I figured out I was the only female, that was a little bit alarming because um, I felt like I was like representing the whole female gender. Um, but it's been an awesome career. As long as you work hard and apply yourself and you're motivated, 
it's been a great company um, to be at, and I plan, obviously, I plan to, to retire from here. Um, but music was foundational to um, a lot of the things I learned, and I think Kirk has a lot of questions on that later. So, yeah, that's it. Excellent. And then to put things into perspective, someone was asking also, if you have likes, SRP, which is <laughs> probably helps you to get those lights. So that is what she works with. Yes, it lights and water. Actually, we're we're a water provider as well. So we both we we're a, a dual a dual company. Excellent. Uh, let me go to Ilya next. Sure. So my name is Ilya Risky. I'm the deputy director for the Department of Arts and Culture at the City of Mesa. So. The Department of Arts and Culture is, is an organization that manages both the Mesa Arts Center uh, as well as a few museums. The Idea Museum, which is a children's museum at the city, as well as the Arizona Museum of Natural History. Um, me being a uh, somewhat native Arizonan, I grew up going to the Arizona Museum of Natural History as well as living in Mesa, so it's kind of an interesting um, kind of loop back around to coming back to my roots. I just recently joined the city of Mesa a few months ago. Um, and then, like Kirk mentioned, I play guitar in my spare time for a, a band in Phoenix. I've continued to play guitar throughout my uh, professional life and started playing when I was uh, a kid in high school. I played piano in high school as well and sang in the chorus, was in plays, had a really uh, strong love of the arts that has carried through uh, despite me not being a professional actor or musician, I still do that a lot in my spare time. So what high school did you go to in Mesa? I went to Dobson High School. Oh, okay. I went to Mountain View. Oh, I was the first, the, first, the first graduating class from, oh, wow. actually, yeah, from Mountain View. So. Nice. Yeah. The alumni in the house. <laughs> now, all the way from Boston, we have Devron. So Devron, can you uh, fill us in here? Sure. And uh, if anyone wants to hear any stories about Kirk from high school, feel free to <laughs> throw those questions in later as well. Uh, so uh, my name is Devron Warner. As Kirk mentioned, I'm from Boston and I work at uh, Harmonix Music Systems as VP of Development. Um, and what we do at Harmonix is we make music video games. So you probably may have heard of uh, Guitar Hero, Rock Band. Um, those are two of the titles that we've done that were uh, fairly popular some years ago. And also Dance Central, which was a dance game. Um, I kind of got my start there uh, when I was in college. A job posting kind of came across uh, the Career Resource Center where I worked as a work study student about, do you like video games? Do you like music? Come test music video games. I was like, that sounds silly. I'm not gonna go do that. that why would I wanna do that? And uh, I gave it a second look and I went and I started off as a QA tester. And what a QA tester does is you essentially play video games, broken video games. So it's, it's not the same as the games that you probably have at home and you play. Uh, and you write up the bugs or the things that are broken with the game for the developers to then later fix. And I did that for a few years, uh, moved from you know a QA tester to a QA lead, eventually into production. And what production does is uh, essentially um, sets the timeline, the schedule, um, budgets, manages the team in terms of hitting um, goals and dates for your uh, project timelines. So I did that for some years. Uh, moved up to, you know, from associate producer to producer, senior producer, executive producer. And now I'm the VP of development at the studio, which essentially means um, I'm responsible for all of the projects that we work on from timelines to budgets to resources, meaning the people that are on the teams and, and um, working with uh, the creative disciplines like artists, um, designers on um, what the actual features uh, of the games that we that we make um, have. So I've been there about 20 years now, which is kind of crazy uh, to me. Um, but yeah, it's, that's what I do. Oh, and I play uh, bass, if uh, <laughs> that's my instrument. Yeah. <laughs> so for those of you that enjoy playing video games, I'd like to see two claps in the chat section. 
and there's a couple of people, Juan, I expect to see have some claps since I know, Juan, you like to play video games a lot. Now I'm gonna go to your instrument. So let's talk about the member like getting the music. I'm gonna start this one with Ilya. So what made you want to start playing music? Uh, my parents uh, forced me to take the piano. Um, and so it was not something that I raised my hand and did. It was that my parents uh, had the foresight to understand that this is something that you will enjoy eventually. So you're going to do it for a couple of years. And then eventually, you're like, oh yeah, this is actually really cool. I really like this. So I started by playing the piano, moved into playing guitar. I sang in the choir in my junior high school and high school. And that's really solidified it. Additionally, my parents are both in the arts. So I was very lucky um, in that from the age of five or six, my parents were taking, a, taking myself and my sister to different plays. Actually, my sister was acting in some plays. Um, and until really recently, uh, I didn't realize that that wasn't a universal experience for people. Like talking to friends of mine and saying, oh yeah, you used to go to like 20 plays every year. It's like, I haven't been to a play ever. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. Um, and so that combined with the love of music that was uh, inspired in me um, from a very early age has kind of driven me to the point I'm at right now. Uh, excellent. And then how about you, Devron? What got you into music? Uh, similarly, my father was uh, or is a musician and um, also a music educator and was uh, worked at Berkeley for many years before he um, retired. So. Uh, I also played piano because I was kind of forced to, um, but from there I, I played uh, saxophone for a little while and then eventually um, kind of settled on uh, bass guitar. And uh, to be honest, I mean, I just kind of grew up in a musical environment. My dad had a recording studio in the basement of our house that I grew up in and, you know, he basically rented studio time to different artists. Uh, uh what was it uh new edition came through at some point maybe so maybe some of you know who new edition is uh so you know, folks yeah so you know so things like bobby brown being in the basement of my house and me sitting on the stairs just watching you know looking down seeing what they were doing down there so um, music was always kind of around me and it was always something i had a passion for because it was also really fun uh, which was the key thing for me back then and um yeah, that's, I think, yeah, that's kind of it. All right, excellent. And then how about you, Nina? What got you into music? So there's a common thread. I was forced to do piano too at a really <laughs> early age. Um, but unlike um, the other two, my parents didn't have any musical background whatsoever. Um, but be because I think they never had the opportunity, they wanted to make sure us, I have two sisters, they wanted to make sure all of us had the opportunity um, to engage and so again I was forced to do piano but really really loved it um, and then in fourth grade and back then when I was in elementary school we were able to join the band um, I just you know had started developing a love for music and decided I just picked the clarinet you know because I thought the clarinet was cool so I played clarinet for a couple years um, and then for whatever reason, my band director um, identified me as the potential to play oboe. So he goes, how about the oboe? And I knew nothing about what that double reed thing was, um, which is, is a pain. Um, but um, picked up the oboe in sixth grade and it was, you know, a, a wonderful opportunity. Um, there's not, I think because of the double reed, there's not a lot of devout oboists or bassoonists around. Um, because it does become complicated to make your own reads at some, play, at some point. Um, you have to make sure you're making your own reads. I started into that adventure um, when I was in, I think it was in junior high, when I started um, to make my own reads. And just had the opportunity then to, you know, I, want, I knew I wanted to go to college, um, but my, mom, my parents weren't um, capable of sending me so I knew I was going to have to do something to get myself to college and that became my instrument um, so I started auditioning um, for scholarships I actually went to NAU um, NAU used to have Kirk did you ever go to NAU music camp a uh, Curry Sermon music camp yeah we send students there 
Yeah. So, so is that still is that still a thing? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, music camp went to actually got a scholarship um, to go to NAU music camp when I was in seventh grade, and then just kept on going. And they have um, Richard U. Parker scholarship that they give out every summer, or used to give out every summer, to a student that was going into their senior year. So you had to audition, I had to um, apply for the scholarship. So I was a recipient of the Richard um, Parker Scholarship um, when I was going into my senior year. So I sort of had, I'm like, so I figured out how to get to college for free. Um, the Parker Scholarship was a full ride music scholarship. Um, so I figured out how to get to um, college and that was my, you know, gateway um, into um, the university and I played in the Flagstaff Symphony. So I played, I had to play a marching band. I had to play in the um, university symphony. I played in the Flagstaff Symphony, auditioned and got into the Flagstaff Symphony. And so it was just um, a career. I, I ended up not majoring in music, but really music took me through my whole college career. And then after that, I auditioned for the, uh, moved back to Mesa, um, auditioned for the Mesa Symphony, uh, made it into the Mesa Symphony and played for um, the Mesa Symphony for quite a few years um, until I started working on my master's degree and having kids. And I just, I had to get, something had to fall off. And so that's when um, sort of I stopped. After I had my second kid, that's when I stopped playing oboe. I still have it. It's a Loray. Um, it's wonderful instrument, but I, I just don't have the time right now to, to play in practice. Oh, wow. That's excellent stories, guys. And something that I think is really important from what I'm hearing you guys say, like even if I think about my musical journey, I started because I wanted to, because a music program came to my school and said, did you want to? And I said, yes. But then I got to a point where I didn't want to. And then that's when my parents says, you will. <laughs> it's very important that, um, students, sometimes you don't want to, and your parents are the ones that tell you, but you will. And you will need to listen to them so that you can get into a brighter position in your future. And it might not be music that you're doing, but the lessons that you're learning while doing music is the important part. And so I want to kind of transition into that, which is, what are some of the lessons that you learned playing music that you use today? So what are some of those lessons, some of those um, things that you were doing in music that you do today to make your job better? And I'll start with Devron for that one. Uh, sure. I mean, I guess the thing that stands out to me the most or the, mo uh, the closest kind of like one-to-one -one is practice. Uh, practicing, uh, you tend to do something that you don't necessarily always want to do over and over again with the goal of improving and, and getting better. And um, as you practice, you usually can see those results immediately. So um, for me, I guess I think about that in terms of tasks or work that I have to do, uh, repetitive things, building a budget, building schedules, things that uh, are not necessarily always fun, but by continuing to do it, kind of stick with it, focus, um, you're able to improve. So that's, that's kind of one thing I would, I would kind of correlate. And the other thing I would say is um, working in a ensemble, you know, small ensemble, big ensemble, whatever it is, really kind of teaches you how to work within a team. Um, you know, there's a whole lot about, um, you know, if you are the rhythm section and you've got the horn section and kind of playing off each other or expecting someone to kind of provide their part to the ensemble to, you know, your kind of counterpart. It's the same thing in kind of any job out there. Um, you have your job and your responsibilities There's a trust and um, uh, piece where you have to rely on the people that you work with and just learning how to deal with those types of relationships, especially when there's conflicts and how to resolve those because all bands get along perfectly all the time. Exactly. <laughs> right. So uh, I would say those are the two things that kind of like jump out to me um, that kind of have a more immediate uh, correlation to what I, to what I do uh, day to day. Excellent. How about you, Nina? I would say um, being tenacious and really um, developing a strong business and work ethic 
Um, as we all know, I mean, we have to fit in our practicing. And I, I just remember being in high school, I was in marching band. I became um, the drum major in marching band. And so what you have to do is you have to figure out how to incorporate all the practices. I remember in marching band being, because it was so dang hot in the summertime, we had to be on the practice field at like 5.30 in the morning. I was not a morning person, but you learn how to adapt, right? You learn that this is a part of the job. So I, I as a senior director at SRP, really respect and really appreciate those employees that are going to be reliable. So they're not going to just not, just because they don't want to come to work, they just say, they just call in sick. We never, you know, when you're the, when you're in band, you know, your band director expects you to be there. You know, your orchestra director expects you to be there. So you develop that really strong business work ethic that, you know, again, there's, there's times when, you know, you're sick and, and you can't go into practice, but I remember if I wasn't in practice, I mean, there was no ditching band practice because my band director was finding me and he was like, where the heck have you been? So it really afforded me to, and I, get, I think to be able to get where I am now because there's times at work where, like Devron said, I mean, you're, it's two o'clock in the morning and you have a major project due the next day, guess what? You're not sleeping. You're staying up all night and you have to, you have to figure out how to make everything fit within a day. So there's some, sometimes when you don't, you don't sleep a lot, um, but because you figured out how to do that in high school and in college, it just follows you into your work life and you are a really respected business person because you've developed that really strong work ethic as in you know in in music and in band and orchestra so. like it Ilya yeah I mean I like both of those answers a lot and uh, I think I'll echo some of them in a kind of a different way um, I think working with a band is really helpful I mean I've actually mentioned in job interviews like using experiences that I've had performing in bands in order to answer questions when they were asking me about like a findings job that I was applying for or an operations job that I was applying for. It has nothing to do with music or has everything to do with working with other people. Um, as a member of a band, like one of the things that I've learned the most is how to get along with other people and as a leader of a band, how to recognize what other people's strengths are so that you can take advantage of them, take advantage, not the best word, but use uh, other people's strengths in order to help accomplish a goal, a shared goal. And that when you're playing in a band or playing music, the shared goal is to create something that's uh, either beautiful or like uh, creatively satisfying. And I, like, I carry that forward into being a leader in my current job. Because I get, after you get to know your staff, you understand what their strengths are and how to best communicate with them in order to get the best, uh, best product out of them and how you can help them be the best employee that they can be. Um, I think it's also really important to know your role. And I learned that from playing in a band. Like, uh, I think both, Ina and Debron mentioned that. Uh, one of the examples, I've actually also used this in a job interview. Uh, I played an Afrobeat group. And if you're not familiar with Afrobeat music, it's basically one chord for eight minutes. <laughs> and so as a guitarist in the rhythm section, I played two bars on repeat for eight minutes. So that sounds really boring. And for the first two months, it was really boring. But then once I started thinking, like, and I joined the band because I loved the music. And after I got over the fact and kind of gained that humility that I am part of the rhythm section, my role is to support and provide a foundation for all these other layers of horns and vocals and a lead vocalist and all this other interesting percussion. 
I, I was able to really lock in and focus on my role and really focus on being a member of the rhythm section, which again, two bars for eight minutes sounds boring and sounds easy, but that's why it's challenging and really engaging for me now. I, I, I've been playing with the band for at least six years and I never think about that anymore. I just think, all right, this is great. I get to go and spend this great time with all these people that I really love. And we get to create this beautiful music and I get to really focus on being a part of the foundation that uh, really allows this music to bloom. Yeah, and I like what you guys are saying too. And I'll say as a person that has been to Ilya shows, like nothing about it is boring whatsoever not even a little bit. And there, there's always shocking moments in these workshops that we do, so shock alert. I even dance when I go to Elias concerts. I dance a lot. I don't know what it is about his band that makes me want to dance, but I definitely- Oh, me too. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it just gets you going. Uh, I'm gonna go to our Q&A here a little bit. So we have some um, questions, and uh, Ms. Abriana would like to know, do you guys still keep music as a hobby? And so let me do, let's start with Nina for that one. So do you still keep music as a hobby? So I'd say music as a hobby right now, just working on the hours that I have. I really don't have, unfortunately don't have time. I would like to pick up the, um, the oboe again. Again, like I said, I, I still have it. Um, and, and start playing it. I, I do tinkle uh, the, the piano. Um, I do have a piano at my house, and so I try to um, play that occasionally. I actually love music, though, Galia. I was on, I was on the board for a while for the Mesa Arts um, Theater, so I really, I love theater. I love, joy, I love musicals, um, so that is, I, I spent so many years in the orchestra pit um, playing all those musicals, playing Fiddler and Sound of Music. And um, so, but now I, I just get a, 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 the opportunity to sit in the audience and, and watch and, and listen. Um, so I still have a passion for it, but as far as myself playing, I don't. The, la the last gig I played, I was um, nine months pregnant with my son, and I played a Christmas gig um, at, um, at the church we attend. And after that, yeah, when I had my son, I mean, he was like, my life was just turned upside down. And so just haven't had an opportunity to, to pick it up again and um, start playing. But ho hopefully, hopefully in my retirement years, um, that's one of my goals is to start picking up the, to pick up the oboe and start playing it again. Excellent. And then Ilya? Yeah, I still keep music as a hobby. I still perform in bands. Um, my biggest challenge is saying no to other people's, like my friends' performances in bands. Like I tried taking on too much. I had to quit my friend's band. Not because like I didn't want to play in it. I just didn't have enough time in the day. I was going to rehearsals too much. And, um, yeah, I just, I can't get enough. <laughs> How about you, Devron? Uh, not as much as I would like, but uh, you know, um, I will get my bass out every so often and attempt to play an arrangement of something that I see on a YouTube video and remind myself how out of practice I actually am. <laughs> um, and you know, before uh, you know, everyone started kind of working from home this year, uh, our studio had like a, like a uh, practice space that anyone in the company could kind of use that had instruments and stuff. So every so often we would get folks together and, you know, just kind of jam out, but uh, nothing more kind of uh, uh, regular than that. Excellent. And then, yeah, I actually, Nina, I too play in the Mesa Symphony, which is now called Symphony of the Southwest. Um, so it's cool that you played in that as well. What are some of the challenges you face when you are playing music? So if you can think about your music playing days, what are some of those challenges that you face? And I'll start with Ilya for this one. Sure. Um, I think like the biggest challenge is really just working with other people. Um, 
and this kind of translates to the work world, I feel as well, like making sure that you have the same expectations or that everybody you're playing music with has the same expectations. And that can go with just setting up an agenda for rehearsal. Like before you get to rehearsal, say, as I'm sure Kirk's talked to all of you about, like, all right, Wednesday, we're going to work on this piece of music. And if we have time, we're going to work on this other one. Because believe it or not, like even with my band of 16 people, we don't always set an agenda. And then it causes problems because either people don't practice or somebody's upset because they wanted to practice a different piece of music. So just setting those expectations really eliminates a lot of conflict. And, and I mean, that's something that I carry forth into my like day-to-day nine-to-five job as well making sure that people understand what's expected of them and that eliminates a lot of anxiety for a lot of people who are around me at work. Ron? Uh, I think kind of like what Nina was saying was the time. Like, you know, I I, uh, don't do as much uh, playing as I did when I was in high school and college, but it's kind of the same story as it was back then, which is it's always hard to fit the time for all the things that you want to do. And it is a commitment, you know, it's like, I always think about the difference between rehearsal and practice because sometimes you blend the two a little bit because you didn't spend the (laughs) right amount of time uh, practicing. So um, I think that that was the biggest challenge. Also when you're in school, um, you know, to be honest with you, you didn't always want to go to rehearsal. If your friends were going to go do something else after school and you wanted to go hang out with them you felt like you were missing out on stuff sometimes but I think that um that was the hardest piece was just the time commitment because it it was always more um time than you realized uh, excellent um this, we have an uh, a light question here this is one of our fans Mr. Oren he would like to know what is your favorite song and then I'm gonna throw something in there I'm gonna ask why so what is your favorite song and why? And I think I get to start with the wrong, no, with Ilya for this one. So what is your favorite song and why? That's a, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, Oren likes to ask the hard questions. That's, yeah, <laughs> I don't think I have a favorite song. I mean, I have favorite songs depending on the mood that I'm in, for sure. What's the um, song you listen to? that you would call your favorite? Um, I'm listening to this one band. Uh, well, let's see. Do you come back to me? Let me think about this for a minute. Oh, wait. It's too hard. No, that's fine, but I think I also made a mistake. Nina, did I skip you on the last question? So Nina, so I gotta go back one. Thank you, Shelly, for letting me know that. So Nina, can you please tell us- I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so can you- Tell us about challenges that you face with music, and sorry about that. Oh no, that that's okay. And I would say I'm a bit of, well, not a bit. I'm a perfectionist, so it was always beating myself up when I didn't perform um, like I thought I could. Um, I um, there was times when. Um, I was, I was taking piano lessons. So I, I, I played piano throughout my career. Um, I actually um, took lessons from a lady in Mesa. I don't know, Ilya, if you, know, if you knew Joanne Woods. Um, she wanted every, all of her students to be a concert pianist. And I didn't necessarily want to be a concert pianist, but I just, I, I was good and she took me on as a student. And I remember struggling with it. She made me sign a contract when I was in junior high. So she made me sign a contract that I would practice four hours a day. So just, just piano. That wasn't, that wasn't oboe because I was still playing oboe too. Oh, and then in junior high, I also played um, tenor sax. So I played tenor sax and jazz band. I love jazz. So I played tenor sax and jazz because, I mean, you can't play oboe in the jazz band, right? I mean, that just doesn't mix. And you can't march with the oboe either. So I played tenor sax in marching band and um, in jazz band. Um, And then I had this piano teacher that wanted me to play practice four hours a day. So I literally, I signed it. I signed the contract. 
And then my poor parents, I, li- I would get up again. I'm not a morning person, but I get up because I get, had to figure out how to pack in four hours of practice, going to school and then practicing the oboe too. So I would get up at five o'clock in the morning. I would practice two hours. Can you imagine like your child, like pounding on the piano at five o'clock in the morning when you're trying to sleep? So I'd practice for two hours in the morning, go to school, then come home and practice two hours of piano at night, do all my schoolwork. Um, And that was, so it was, it was like a balance. You really figure out how to manage your life and how to manage um, everything you need to do. But to Devron's, you know, comment, you, you know, your friends are going out and having fun and I didn't really have a lot of time to socialize with friends. So you really learn how to do um, a balancing act with the limited and time that that you had. So I think that was my struggle. And then when I didn't, then there was times in your career too, in your, in your playing career where you're not at the pinnacle. So you have to be tenacious and you have to realize that our times because you can't always continue to just continue to get better, right? There's going to be times you're going to have hills and valleys in your playing career. And so you have to be tenacious. You have to realize if you're having, if you're struggling in certain aspects of your playing technique, just you'll get over that hurdle, but you have to persevere. So you learn perseverance and how to just um, continue to, to work through complications and difficulties you, you might have. Oh, yes. Excellent answer to that. Appreciate that. Now see why I was off. Devron was supposed to go first. So that means Devron gets the next question is what is your favorite song? (laughs) I mean, you know, I'm going to cop out too. I can't choose a favorite song, unfortunately, but I could say my favorite genre is probably like hip hop R&B, maybe a little bit more neo soul type stuff like the Jill Scott. So I was just talking to a friend of mine about the Jill Scott live album from about 10 years ago, where I just played it so much that I thought I had been at that concert, um, <laughs> which was not true. But, uh, <laughs> but I would say that, but I mean, you know, I, I listen to so many different genres, genres of music, partly because of, you know, what I do for work, but also just because, you know, I might need to listen to a certain type of music to be able to focus on what I'm trying to do that day. Um, but yeah, that, I can't pick a favorite song. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good answer though. How about you, Nina? I'm with Devon, R&B and hip hop are my favorite. And I'll just go with anything Michael Jackson. Um, I was raised on um, Michael Jackson. And, you know, unfortunately the, the day he passed away was so devastating for me because I was so excited to go and and watch his tour performance and I mean I was literally being I was hyping myself up to get a ticket you know to go to one of his concerts um, and so when he you know passed away unexpectedly it was um, it was really devastating but been to Las Vegas. Um, if you guys have ever had ever had the opportunity um, to go watch his show um, in Las Vegas, it's just it's just amazing. So we we went to Vegas. This was a few years ago, and I was for my son who was playing basket club basketball, and so I wanted to go to the Michael Jackson show, right? And so I'm like, okay, how, who's going to go with me? And they're like, everybody's like, how much are tickets? And I'm like. They're $200, but who cares? This is Michael Jackson, right? And um, nobody was like, nobody was like, wanted to go with me. They're like, we're not going to go pay $200 for a show. I'm like, oh, come on. So I literally um, scheduled, I went and bought myself a ticket on the second row on the aisle. I was just, talk about rocking. I mean, I was like rocking out Michael Jackson um, all by myself. I loved it. Um, been back since. Um, but r and I just, I can't sit still with r and I, lo- I love to dance. Um, and r and and hip-hop stuff, um, 80s music, um, I'm there. <laughs> How about you, Elia? <laughs> yeah, um, like DeBron, I have listened to everything. Lots of uh, neoclassical to hip-hop to r and to smattering of different rock styles. I think, I was thinking about it, I think my favorite song though, 
is uh, the first track off of Most Steps record, Black on Both Sides. It's called Fear Not of Man. It's got a great message and it samples uh, Fela Kuti, who's a father of Afrobeat. And so, and Afrobeat's very dancey, very kind of uplifting and spiritual. And kind of that combination with his message with that song, I think is something like, whenever I hear it, it automatically puts me in a good mood and kind of brings me up a little bit, so. Yeah. There's a there's a great story about Questlove uh, uh, DJing for uh, Prince, I think it was, or some party that Prince was at, and he and and Quest was talking about, oh, like I'm gonna put on this Fela because Prince is gonna love it, and I will not spoil the story, but you should check it out because it's pretty good. <laughs> it, it's funny, like whenever people like to ask musicians, "What's your favorite song?" and then, and it's funny, like when I asked you guys, I realized the difficulty of the question because you're busy listening to so much that you can't, it's like, what's your favorite child? And so <laughs> you can't do that. But I always go, all right, what's the first thing I think of? And for that one, when he asked it, the first one I thought of, there's this uh, composer named Gustav Mahler. And Gustav Mahler wrote this piece called, well, Symphony Number no. 2, The Resurrection. And I think what was cool about and I'm in this resurrection mode. So I'm in this, yes, we're in quarantine. Yes, we can't go out. Yes, things aren't the same. But when we can, like Sounds Academy, myself, everything is going to come out in this. If you just listen to the beginning of the Resurrection Symphony, it's time to wake up in the morning and go running for five miles. It's like that type of energy in it. And it just talks about, well, not talk literally, but you're picturing this hero in a movie that is trying to resurrect himself because in symphony number one, he died. And so we thought he died and now here he is in symphony number two and he's back. So I think that's a great symphony to listen to. Oh my um, gosh, that is like my all time favorite high in my musical performance is the Mahler's Resurrection. Oh yeah. That is like, I remember being on, you literally are on a, when you play it, you literally are on a high at the end. I mean, you cannot just not smile. Right. So that, that is so cool. Yes, I, we played that in the Flagstaff Symphony and it was just was phenomenal. Uh, so this one I'm going to ask you, I don't remember who I'm supposed to start with, I think it's Nina, uh, which is going to be what, so this is an interesting question. So what, and I'm getting multiple ones of them, so I'm trying to read two questions into one. What impact has music had on your life slash career? So you can answer either one of those. So the impact that music had on your life and or career. Um, I think um, music has had a huge impact on both. Um, number one, it develops the other side of the brain. And I really do think it makes you a smarter person. It makes you a more well-rounded person. And to what everybody's talked about, it just makes you um, a person that knows how to, to work with others. And music has afforded me the opportunities to travel. Um, when I was in college, I tried out for, I don't know if you remember, it used to be called Continental Orchestra and Singers. Um, so I traveled, and what this, um, this group does is they travel over, over the summertime. So I auditioned and um, was afforded the opportunity to play in the orchestra. So we traveled for the entire summer. We played every single night at a different venue. We also um, got on in Florida, we got on a cruise ship. We were the entertainment, um, part of the entertainment for a cruise ship. Traveled um, to the Bahamas, um, flew to Bermuda, played concerts in Bermuda for a week. Um, so, and just traveled all over the United States as well. So it allows you to um, expand um, your traveling it allows you to and affords you to to go places and and see the world i mean when i was in high school and college we would travel and and do you know play down dis you know disneyland um we were in the parade in disneyland i was the drum major um in a disney parade and so it really does it allowed me to 
to grow up. It allowed me to see um, other parts of the world and other parts of the country that I necessarily wouldn't been able to see because my parents could afford it. And it has really helped me in my career because it's, it's helped me in my work ethic and it's helped me to, to be a stronger person. And I really think um, I learned how to never, my motto is never, never, never give up. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's music. You know, sometimes you screw up and you don't play as well as you wanted to, to, but guess what? You don't give up. You know, you just keep on, um, you know, moving ahead and you keep on practicing and you really develop this um, tenacious personality and this um, I can do it personality. So it, it's helped me in, in both my um, career and, and my life. Yeah. How about you, Ilya? Remind me of the question. It's what, what the impact of music has been on my career and my life, correct? Career or life, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, I, I mean, I wouldn't have, without music, I wouldn't have the same friendships that I have now. I wouldn't have, like, I mentioned the same experiences. Like, I've used music to go on tour with my friends and play music in different areas of the country. I've played in, in bands in Europe and I was briefly a choir director in Bangladesh when I was working at this university, um, which if I hadn't had a background in music, I wouldn't have uh, taken on. Um, so it's given me a lot of really incredible experiences where I've been able to uh, interact with a lot of people in a way that you don't normally like everybody who plays music know music knows that like the people that you play music with you have a special connection with because you're able to communicate in this very unique way that you don't get to communicate with other non-musicians in that same way because you don't have that experience like and what Nina said about having a, a kind of a musical high from playing that Mahler piece like that's why we all keep coming back, right? That goosebumps feeling. That's why I keep coming back. And by building those relationships with your friends and the other musicians, like you have, you get to have those experiences with other people and that's super unique. And like that, yeah, it's uh, something that really drives me to keep going and keep playing again and again. Because like, also like everybody said, not everybody likes to practice all the time. But we all know that in order to get to that really cool spot and have those great experiences, we got to go through all this extra work and go to rehearsal and make sure that we're practicing and we're on point so that we don't let the rest of the team down so that everybody can, can hit that goal at the same time. And as far as like my career goes, like I'm the deputy director for a arts organization. My, my boss, my new boss asked me why I didn't, mentioned that I played in Phoenix Afrobeat Orchestra in my cover letter. And it's because it wasn't really explicitly written in the job description and it was just like, yeah, so I'm great at doing budget and I've been doing organizational management for a really long time. She's like, why didn't you talk about being a musician and doing all this other stuff that you do in your spare times? You're right, I should have mentioned that. That's, but it's all played into exactly where I am now. Excellent, and I, and I, and I like, and I'm, I wanna point this out, especially for our students here. What I hear you saying is that even though you don't like practicing, you need to practice to get to that ultimate level of why we do this in the first place. So I'll say it again, just in case the people in the back didn't hear. Even though you may not like practicing, the only way to get to that level is to practice. Let's let that stick for a minute. All right, Devron, how about you? <laughs> uh, I guess I would say that if it wasn't for music, I would not have the career that I currently have. I mean, it's kind of a direct path for me. I played music in high school and went to college and did music there and was at college when I learned about the opportunity at, you know, the place that I'm at now. Um, which, you know, was Berkeley College of Music, so it was a music school. So for me, I mean, it, it, music 
I wouldn't say has defined my life, but it definitely has been a key factor in, um, you know, the opportunities that I've had and the successes that I've had. Um, and kind of like with the thing that Kirk was saying, it's like, uh, you know, practice, uh, rehearsals, performance, like life is kind of a performance, you know, if I, if I can go there for a moment. And, um, you know, when you think about uh, a performance that you're going to do, you're in an ensemble, like what's one of the things that kind of happens immediately prior to that is you've got your sound check usually, right? Because the goal there is to ensure that you figured out everything that you um, need to in terms of like, do we got the right amps? Is the PA hooked up correctly? Are you going to be over here? How does it sound? What's the mix like? Before you actually do your show. And it's, it's very similar in terms of like practice and preparedness in your career. If I have to pitch some wacky game idea to Microsoft, uh, you better be sure I've spent a lot of time <laughs> working on that pitch prior to, you know, flying out and meeting with those folks. And I perform it or do a sound check in front of people and say, hey, how, how was that? Like, uh, you know, maybe leave that part out or maybe, you know, you might want to go this way a little bit. So, um, you know, and those are things you learn uh, from uh, um, practicing, rehearsals, performing, um, it's all kind of part of that cycle. And it, it really does apply as you um, get to points. So if you have an idea of something you want to do and, and you're figuring out the right way to get that across, it's kind of a performance. You know, you're trying to figure out what are the things to say or bring to people's attention that's going to get them the most excited. Similarly, if you're thinking about an arrangement of a song that people have heard a gazillion times before, but you want to do a slightly different arrangement to kind of, you know, surprise people. So, I, I think that's uh, that is my answer. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I'm just going to do this really quickly because I think this is directed towards Ilya. So Nina, you mentioned that you went to NAU, and then Devron, you mentioned that you went to Berkeley. Ilya, did you go to um, College for Music? No, I went for I got my undergraduate degree in sociology and my uh, graduate degree in public administration. So public administration is like learning how to work in uh, management for either government or the nonprofit sector. All right, excellent. Yeah, man, you guys are popular. There's so many questions here. We're not gonna be able to get to all of them since it's about time to close out. Um, but what I will do is, so this for our last question, and you could just answer it whenever you're ready. So like a one-liner on, so there's a child out there that's, I like doing music, but I don't know if I want to do music or do another career. Um, what piece of advice, what one-liner would you give to that child? Uh, you can have both. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to choose. You know, I, I would say um, if you love music and it's something you want to do, uh, continue to do it it could turn into something uh, or help you find opportunities. I mean, I think a lot of us here can talk about just being in music has opened up opportunities for us, for people that you meet and people that have um, similar uh, um, uh, things that they like to do. And then if there's something else that you're interested in, do that too. You can, you can do it. You know, there's so many different um, things that people have access to that you can kind of just start and, and kind of go from there. Yep, thank you for that. And you make really long um, life relationships as well. Um, my best friend um, that I still have, um, I met her when I was a freshman in um, college and we were both um, in band. Um, she actually graduated and um, she played the trumpet. And so she graduated from NAU in trumpet performance. She's still a band director um, today, and she's a band director in Chandler, um, in Chandler School District. And it, it really, you develop um, these friendships because you're with these people for so long, you know, in, in practice and traveling. Um, it, they're just, you just meet some really neat people. Um, that are able to, you know, help you out and throughout your life and throughout your career. Um, one of my, I mentioned Mahler Resurrection is one of my all-time, my second all-time um, favorite piece I've ever performed was, was in her senior recital. 
I played English horn. It was an English horn, um, flugel horn duet uh, with a um, 16 piece orchestration ensemble um, was Copeland's Quiet City. If you have never listened to Copeland's Quiet City, um, I you know, encourage you to do so. It's just a wonderful, wonderful, I, I love Copeland as well as, as Mahler, um, but Copeland has some wonderful pieces, but that, that duet um, with orchestration is, is really good. So it's just, it just helps you, um, you know, develop some really good, good friends um, that will stick with you for the rest of your life. Yeah, it's true. Did you want to add anything, Elia? Uh, life's short. Do as many fun things as you can. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much. Can I get two claps in the comments for them? Um, thank you guys for sharing your stories, sharing your advice. I put a link in the chat. If you guys can please fill that out, that helps us to make these things better for you guys. And then next week, next week, Thursday, we're going to have introduction to the guitar. So for those that may be interested in learning how to play the guitar, this is gonna be a great one for that. You may know someone that's interested in playing the guitar. So please share this with them. So once again, thank you guys ever so much. And I look forward to seeing you guys next week as well. All right, bye-bye.